turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 131. I want to talk to you about the significance of having a quiet heart. David is writing this psalm. And Matthew Henry says that this is David's profession to God in answer to Saul, who thought that David was selfishly ambitious for the crown. He thought David was pr proud in heart. David writes, O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Charles Spurgeon said that this is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. Samuel Cox called this psalm the song of humility. I want you to notice something, that David says, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. We see that the heart affects the eyes. Not just what you see, but how you see things. If there be no life in the chest, then there will be no life in the eyes. The heart and the eyes are linked. Paul prays in Ephesians for the eyes of the heart. David here is showing us that as the heart is, so is the man. Spurgeon also said of this, if the heart is right, then the eyes are right. See, if the heart is lifted up, it will then begin to look down on others. If the heart is lifted up, it will either look with envy upon those above them or with disdain upon those beneath them. David says, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. The countenance of a man shows the condition of a man. As the heart affects a man's perspective, the way he sees things and his values, David goes on and says, I don't involve myself in matters too great for me, things too difficult for me. He knows his, his limits. He sees what he can take and what he can't take. Matthew Henry writes that David's heart could witness with him that he had walked humbly with God. Charles Spurgeon once said, some people in wishing to be great have ceased to be good. But David is showing that it is not in his heart to be great. So therefore, it is not in his perspective. It is not in his eyes or his, his aspirations. David knows he's unable to force God's hand to do his own will. Even more so, such an aspiration is, is not even in his eyes because it is not in his heart. Humility is gravity in the spiritual life. It keeps us, it keeps us grounded. Humility is God's guide along his pathway. There's a story of an old saint who slipped into a vision and saw traps all over the world. And he thought, there's no way I can walk through this world without stepping in a trap. And he asked the Lord, is it possible? And God speaks back to him and says, humility. See, humility will save us from traps personally and relationally and also in ministry. It's important to notice that as Christ's humility came to men and brought men to God, so a humble heart brings man to God and God to man. See, humility is the point of contact with God. Um, there's a special scripture in Romans 12, 3. He says, For through grace, the grace given to me, I say to everyone who is among you, 
not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Paul is showing that sobriety in the Christian life is humility and that that intoxication with oneself is the essence of pride. And Paul is urging them through grace to not think of themselves more highly than they ought. And here in Psalm 131, we see that our spiritual writer takes us further in the understanding of what it is to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. He says, connected to his humility, he says, surely, that's the connection word. I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. We see here that pride, the opposite of humility, the antithesis to humility is disquietude. Humility is quieted. Pride is disquieted. Humility is still. Pride is agitated. Humility is collected thoughts, a calm heart, and a steady will. Just notice that, that David says, I have. This is his personal choice. He shows that it is, it is him personally that has chosen this. He's retracting from self-centered heaviness. That heaviness that comes through self-centeredness, ambitions, and aspirations outside of trust in God. It's important to note, too, that choice is the purpose of David using the weaned child. A child not weaned is at the mercy of its mother. It has no choice. It can't walk. It can't move away. But a weaned child can choose to come to his mother or not. Such imagery is what Jesus is using in Matthew 18, verse 3, when he says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Some commentators believe that the weaning is from the world, but it can't be because if the weaning is a figure of being weaned from the world, then the chest that he's resting against must be the world as well. So it can't be that. It has to be that the weaning is pointing to a choice to come to God, which is very similar to Andrew Murray's wonderful definition of a child. He said, childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. So a composed and quieted soul is the absence of self-consciousness. That which agitates us and stirs us up is that thing that lifts us. It is self-consciousness that gets in the way. It is the ceasing of our efforts that brings us into direct contact. The, an the Amplified Version of the Bible says that it calls this cease fretting or cease worrying. Take a golden pen and inscribe this on your heart. Direct contact with God is experienced in rest. It is childlike to rest upon God, to leave all efforts and high thoughts of oneself and to choose to rest completely upon Him. This resting against Him means that we have been taught to renounce the world and live upon God. Having the ability in us to choose to feed upon something else, humility is choosing to be satisfied with God alone. <laughs> Praise God. David, he laid upon God when no one else could see. He looked not for thrones or supremacy. A quiet heart, a soul at rest, like a child, upon his chest. See, not as the athlete wrestling for a crown, taking heaven by violence of will, but as a child with your father sit down and know the bliss that follows be still. Matthew Henry writes that if God had ordered David, David would have been well content to spend the rest of his days in the sheepfolds with God. This is that humility, that quiet heart that rests against God. Oh, what great gain comes from contentment. Oh, contentment is when God is your content. When you have him, you need nothing else. So a trust is being spoken of here that is strong enough to end efforts. A trust is here that is quietness itself resting upon God. Richard Wormbrand said one of my favorite quotes one time, um, he said, the highest form of prayer that I know is a quiet heart beating that loves him. 
So if you look at Isaiah 30, verse 15, in repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. It is being quieted on the inside that gives you a strength so that you're not blown over by whatever happens in this life or what others do to you. You can remain grounded and strong in him. See, it is far better to, to have a quiet heart than to be given the world's riches without it. If you look at Proverbs 17, verse 1, it says, A dry morsel and quietness with it is better than a, a house full of feasting with strife. See, quietness in and of itself has a feeding. It, it satisfies you just being quiet before the Lord. And I, I got to remind you of my favorite Tozer quote. Could there be anything more important than sitting in silence before God every day? It's interesting too, in Ecclesiastes 9, 17, it says, the words of the wise are heard in quietness. <laughs> the words of the wise are heard in quietness. So quietness makes us strong. It removes the weakness that is brought about by human effort. I want you to notice this last statement here that is connected with repentance. Rest and quietness are a matter of the surrender of the will to God. See, we have an additional clarity brought to us about this quietness in Isaiah 32, verse 17. He writes, Isaiah writes, the work of righteousness, listen to this, will be peace. The work of righteousness will be peace. When God gives you righteousness, by faith, through Christ, you have peace, period. And look at this, and the service of righteousness. This is what righteousness works in you. Quietness and confidence forever. <laughs> it's crazy. This is why Clement of Rome can label the Christian race the children of quietness. The absent we have this absence of self-consciousness, composed and quieted before God, receiving strength from Him. John Bunyan, John Bunyan equally values the absence of the cluttering multiplicities of life. And these, he refuses to tolerate these voices in the mind by writing this. If we have not quietness in our minds, outward comfort will do no more for us than a golden slipper on a gout foot. Oh, for the wayward noise of pride is as dangerous as gangrene. It spreads through your whole being. As sure as pride is deserting God, humility is resting upon him. It was Augustine of Hippo who wrote that pride is to imagine itself as the source of its life. <laughs> so many people live this way. And humility will save us from this way. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote, Pride causes us to use our gifts as if they came from us. See, without gratitude, we indirectly express, we believe we deserve something. But gratitude keeps us in humility that remembers we are nothing. We deserve nothing. And everything that God gives to us, He gives from His goodness. I remember one day, I was thanking the Lord for my kids' health and uh, my health and uh, the everything. And I heard the Holy Spirit ask me, why are you thanking me for these things? And when he asked me the question, the motive was exposed in that moment m more than I could see before. And I saw that I was thanking him so that he would know I'm grateful so that he doesn't ever take them away. And I find that that could be a, a lot of the reason why people thank God for things. Oh, I better thank him because if I don't, he may see me as ungrateful and take it from me to teach me a lesson. I want to encourage you that that day when this happened to me, I felt the Holy Spirit teach me in my heart what it is to be really grateful. And it is not thanking God for things so that he doesn't take them away. But gratitude is this a recognition of the fact that we are nothing and that we deserve 
absolutely nothing and that everything comes from him. And it is his expression of love and goodness that gives us air to breathe, keeps us healthy, provides for us, gives us a wife and children, blesses our home, leads us in life, provides for our small needs, even the things that others don't think God would even be interested in. You find him meeting them for you all the time. And we can be grateful because each one of these things, none of us deserve it. Even if you were good, perfect for the rest of your life, you still do not deserve anything. It is Christ that is the means by which we receive anything from God. Pride usurps the glory of God. Listen to this one. Spurgeon writes, Pride defiles everything, as mire in the spring causes mud in all the streams. So David concludes the humble quieting of his soul upon God with these words, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. An everlasting expectation and trust in God is the end all. As Proverbs twenty two nineteen says, so that your trust may be in the Lord, I have taught you today. Here's the end of all teaching to bring us to deeper trust in God. Henry states, this psalm brings us to live comfortably upon God and his covenant of grace. See, to trust in God in humble, quiet, childlike existence that experiences direct contact with God is the most wonderful state of being that there is to completely abandon everything over to him, trust him completely, and lay upon him in direct contact and fellowship. So I leave you with this summary quote from St. Teresa of Avila. She said, the indwelling presence is the focal point of prayer. We need no wings, only a silent place where we can center our gaze upon him. I hope this blessed you today. Um, I want humility. I know that God loves humility. Humility. As a matter of fact, let me just read you this last scripture from Isaiah. I want to walk in God's presence and live in God's presence. And I know you do too. And we can see here in Isaiah 57, I believe. Listen to this. For thus says the high and exalted one, this is God, who lives forever and whose name is holy. This is God. <laughs> he says, I dwell on high on a high and a holy place, but also with the contrite and the lowly in spirit. So God dwells in the heavens, untouchable, but he's so amazing that he makes his dwelling place also in the lowly, the humble. God has two dwelling places, heaven and a humble heart. <laughs> then it says, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. See, he has this favor for the humble. Uh, he has this love. It wins his heart. It's the essence of what Jesus was. His humility was the means by which he fulfilled all God's purposes. Andrew Murray once said, humility is the pathway unto death. We, we obey God completely. Humility is why Moses was chosen. He was the humblest man in the world. Humility wins God's heart. It's so much better to get our eyes off of us and turn them to God, for that is the definition of humility. Andrew Murray also said, humility is the dethronement of self and the enthronement of God. Lord, I I worship you. We are never more humble than when we adore Jesus. It is the key. So Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we choose to humble ourselves and recognize we are nothing. We deserve nothing. We have nothing in and of ourselves. So we cast ourselves on your mercy, knowing that you are good. And with faith, we receive the Spirit that makes us humble. We receive 
the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and give us the humility of Jesus that we might yield into, clothe ourselves with the humility of Christ by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, the words of Andrew Murray are coming up in my heart. Let us flee to Jesus until we are clothed with humility. So that's the route. We come to Jesus and he little by little increases our understanding of our depravity and our confidence and dependence upon his glory. And this is the growing in humility, changing the way we see everything in our lives. So thank you so much for watching this video. Listen, if you're not a Patreon uh, supporter of us, it's $1 a month. Uh, there's a link below, but I want to show you what the exclusive content is like that comes to only my patrons, those that have chosen to become a patron supporter. I give uh, uh, every other day I'll send spiritual thoughts that the Holy Spirit's been speaking to my heart. Uh, just recently, I released a song to them um, that I didn't release anywhere else. But if you want that kind of exclusive content, we've reserved that for those that have uh loved our videos and liked our videos enough to say, I'm in with you. We want to support you. But a Patreon is just $1 a month. So if you want to become a patron, it will help us tremendously. And you'll have access to this exclusive content. Here is a sample of the kind of things that uh, I send on a, on a consistent basis to my patrons. Patrons. Hey guys, uh, three things this morning. Number one, I felt like the Lord was reminding me this morning as I was sitting with him that love is direct access to him, direct access to him. Meaning most of the time when I sit down to be with the Lord, my, my heart is laid upon him. Immediately I go to, oh, how I love you. Oh, how I love you. Thinking of his wonderful condescension coming from heaven to earth to live perfectly for me, to die for me, to raise for me, and and then ascend for me, and then send the Spirit to me. All of this is love unmatched, matchless. And so that love that he has shown towards me has my heart, my mind, and I give my heart to him in response to his love for me. So first thing is when we pray a key, and I believe the only real grounds for communion with God is love. Oh Lord, how I love you. I love you, Lord. I worship you. Uh, laying everything down there at his feet. I lay down what I want. I lay down my family. I lay down my desires, my dreams, my expectations. I lay it all down in love at your feet. Uh, in the book of Revelation, when the elders see the glory and majesty, he, they throw themselves down at his feet. This is an expression of like the ultimate love, humility, and adoration that there is. And so I feel like that's a key for experiencing God in prayer, that number one. Number two, remember, and I have to do this a lot, that when I'm there in worship and enjoying his presence, remembering that he is a person, that means that I'm attentive to whatever it is he would lead me to do his leading has attention if we think him to be a method then we won't even look for a leading but if we will look at him knowing that we are with a person then practice goes out the window and we can literally just be attentive to him and follow whatever it is that he leads us to inclines our hearts towards and you know sometimes you 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 feel like you missed what he was doing but at least you were attentive and that's very important that we would just be attentive to his person that's the essence of prayer i believe it's teresa of avila who said we need no wings just a quiet place where we can center our hearts upon him um and lastly number three i have a question for you and i'd love it if you would answer me in the comments i'll read through all of them but have you seen people that do not actually live for God or live under God or live submitted to God, profess trust in God. It's confusing to me. And the, the, I see posts and I see, you know, uh, 
I'm around some people and they talk about trust in God. Uh, I was with a barber just the other day and he was cutting my hair and he was talking about how he trusts in God. But the rest of everything else that he said was about himself. Uh, he was, you know, just in dirty mouth talking about chasing people with guns and all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyways, all this to say, have you seen people profess trust in God when they're not living trust in God? And if you have, what do you think about it? I mean, the starting point of everything is trust. So is it, should we have like mercy and say, well, they're very immature, but they're trusting. They're, they're at least on the right path that they're looking towards the Lord. Or do you think we should just nail it to the wall and be like, you don't, you do not trust the Lord. You're a liar. You know? <laughs> so anyways, I want to know your thoughts on it. So if you could write down below, I'd love to hear it. Uh, God bless you guys. I am praying for you every single day. And I'm so grateful for your support. God bless you.